Well, good morning. Um, this is Pastor Varga with uh, Daytona Rescue Mission and Ridgewood Avenue Baptist Church. Um, we're having our Sunday school um, through the internet. We've um, uh, not able to meet. We have the restrictions on gathering, and um, but God knows all about it. And so we're um, we're glad to be able to meet here, and we're going to talk on the subject today of um, the judgment of God. Um, I read over several times recently, I posted it on Facebook, you can see it on here. Um, in the first uh, Great Awakening, the pastor that was deemed to be one of the primary uh, members of it that kind of started was Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I believe it was in <clears throat> in um, 1741, and the Great Awakening was then, the first Great Awakening, and Jonathan Edwards, and it was probably, I, I have never heard um, a better sermon on judgment than that. There probably are, were ones preached that were better, but what a what what a sermon it was and um they say when Jonathan Edwards made that uh it, they said that he was a he wasn't a bombastic preacher there was another one that was part of the first awakening and that was George Whitfield he was a great preacher but Whitfield and you can read his messages it's, it's all historic and the, the great awakening but he was a um uh, he was a theatrical person. I think he had a background of theater and acting. And so he was bombastic and very theatrical in his motions and everything. But they say that Jonathan Edwards uh, read his sermons uh, in a monotone. He had it written out, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I, I encourage you to get it and, um, and read it. Or with the technology we have today, when I, I put it up, I... I not only look at it and read it, but I have them read it to me, and then I'm hearing it and I'm reading it together. But um, they say that in those days, the um, the structures, they were held up by um, support beams that they, they weren't all that far apart. They didn't have like, uh, in our church now, we have the great uh, uh, concrete uh, things that are... Um, these big things they bring out on the truck and, and you can have large expanses of of open area but then they didn't and they had to have um, of course they used wood in those days and big support beams and they have to have uh, the big to hold them up they had these uh, stanchions or, or these um, they were actually posts posts is what they were but they say that when he read his sermon in a monologue uh, just that people were so uh, aware of the damnation of hell that they say they could feel the flames of hell licking at their feet and they they were hanging on to the poles not wanting to fall into hell so quite a sermon and it's 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 probably the most expressive sermon I've ever read, read on on judgment and the mercy of God that can save a sinner. So judgment is something that I think at this time of the coronavirus that that we have to look at who God is and we have to um, get the perspective of where we've come from and, and who we are. And we, we, we have, um, I believe we have a funny understanding. Uh, even at that time, um, when the first awakening came, there was there were churches that were going in the uh, realm of um, modern day, what's called modern day Christianity or modern day religion, where they were looking to man and humanism and and philosophy more than uh, the miracles and the uh, the damnation of hellfire and the savior and the blood of Christ and all of that and. And so this this modernism that we have in Christianity today 
And this started way back in the 1700s. It's nothing new. And there's the forms of it way back to the Bible times, actually. There's always been a type of false uh, teaching. Uh, but we have to today, in the day of, we have to examine what's going on worldwide. Do you, do you realize now that this plague uh, that God has allowed or he has brought or or I think he's trying to get our attention and even even those that are tremendously wealthy, the the uh, the billionaires, the Bezos, the Gates, the uh, the very very rich that have their own planes to to go 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 anywhere they want. But where are you going to go today to escape the plague? You can't go anywhere. In fact, you can't even fly hardly. And so God's trying to get our attention. There was one comment made. Um, and someone had um, uh, one of my uh, friends from the chaplain ministry, Sister Moore. She was a chaplain uh, when I was with the chaplains in Daytona Beach, and 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 she said something that there was a prophecy made in uh, um, 1987 or something. Uh, now, I'm of the strain. I'm of the Bible preachers who believe the prophetic statements were made um, in the Bible. And there are a few yet to be in the, I believe the next prophetic statement that will be fulfilled will be the rapture of the church. I believe that's what it will be. And then after that, the tribulation will start. But uh, there are believers, and mostly in the Pentecostal uh, stream. My mom and dad were Pentecostals, Assemblies of God. And, and there's some good people in there and saved people, and they get people saved. Not so much anymore as they used to. Old time, I like the old time Pentecostals, like my grandma and grandpa on both sides. They were old school Pentecostals, the old Assemblies of God, which I liked, uh, um, where the um, the ladies dressed like Christians and didn't dress like Jezebel. And and uh, you got some Jezebels today in it. And uh, yeah, well, a lot of the church movement, we got so there's no power in the church today. But anyway. It was mentioned that there were people saying, well, this is the third great awakening coming now. Well, there are some signs of uh, plague and famine and people not in the streets and all of this kind of stuff. But the big sign of the, of awakening is uh, the repentance and the acknowledgement of sin and the turning from sin. We have to acknowledge that. You dear ones that are watching, Share this with others. Uh, if you're saved today, we, we, we have to understand that the only hope we have for America uh, is in the Lord and turning to Christ. And of course, Second Chronicles 714, it says, if my people, God's people, born again people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. And so I heard someone quote that um, here, but it, that's the whole verse, and it talks about repentance, uh, and then forgiveness of sin, and then the healing of the land. So sin has to be acknowledged, and which we don't. I I, I believe Vice President. Pence is a Christian from the testimony I've heard. I believe he's a Christian man. But I've heard him say lately in, in the last week or so um, that that we will be able to, that through the efforts of the government and the doctors and so on, and, and uh, that, that we will, they will be able to uh, heal our nation of this plague. God's only one can heal our nation. Oh, well, may, well may, they might be able to get some antibiotics to the to the virus and so on and so forth but God's trying to get our attention don't you understand that now this thing I'm not trying to be a, an alarmist but I think God's trying to get our attention but I don't think he has gotten our attention yet it was mentioned to me uh, even just this very day that there seems to be some uh, thought to God a little bit well if there is it's very little bit it isn't much at all it's a little prayer here or there, but nothing like the Great Awakening uh, in the first and the second. And um, where preaching that was done uh, was like by Jonathan Edwards. And um, 
John Wesley and George Whitfield and Charles Finney and others during these great awakenings where God had a great moving. So we need to have it, dear one, but God needs to get our attention. So what I'm saying is not to be an alarmist, but I don't think he has gotten our attention here in America or around the world. And, uh, I mean, he, uh, he could make it much worse in a minute. He could bring a worse plague. Someone, I don't know, um, there's a lot of things coming out. I, uh, someone sent me another thing on the Facebook that that there's another plague coming out of China um, that uh, has to do with rats, and it's supposed to be worse than this, so I don't know. Whatever. God could use this one or another one, but he's trying to get our attention. We are his creation. God created the heavens and earth, and he created you and I in his image. In his image. In we need to realize that and we we need to realize that we've um, uh, we've sinned against God and uh, we are sinful uh, creatures that have gone against God and need to repent and as that uh, sermon I'll just maybe even read you a line or two from it it's it's so amazing um uh of um uh, this um uh, Jonathan Edwards, it says in this verse, he, he has the, the verse that he, uh, that he used that he kicked off his sermon on, their foot shall slide in due time, Deuteronomy 32, 35. And then uh, Dr. Edwards says, in this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace and as they did we do today they in a different time but who notwithstanding all God's wonderful works towards them remained as Deuteronomy 32 28 says void of counsel having no understanding in them under all the cultivations of heaven they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit as we are today as in the two verses next preceding the text the expression i have chosen for my text their foot shall slide in due time seems to imply the following things relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites are exposed. Number one, Jonathan Edwards says in his sermon, Sinners in the, in the Hands of an Angry God, that they were always exposed to destruction as one that stands or walks in slippery places. Now, put yourself in that place always exposed to fall. This implied to the manner of their destruction coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding. The same is expressed, surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. And that's in Psalm seventy-three, eighteen. Number two, uh, Jonathan Edwards says, it implies that they were always exposed to sudden, unexpected destruction. Watch it. This needs to be preached today like it was then. As he that walks in slippery, uh, he cannot foresee he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning. Get that now which is also expressed in surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. Number three, that was Psalm 73, 18 and 19. Another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another. So he that stands or walks on slippery grounds needs nothing 
but his own weight to throw him down. We have all this talk today. I hear so much about uh, that they see on the TV, government people and on and on, even preachers. Uh, we're just victims. We're not at fault. At all. No, they, they just don't want to acknowledge a sin. And they, and they, they like so many people tell me, we're just, why me? You know, I'm just a victim. Oh, no, we, got, we all got our sin, don't we? That the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. So there's a time when you and I can reject God for so long and and live in our sin and, and play the victim role in things, and we're, li- we're on slippery ground, but we can very easily slip off into the fires of hell if we don't take action, like Dr. Edwards says here. For it is said that when the due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide, then they shall be left to fall, and as they are inclined by their own weight, God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but he will let them go, and then at that very instant they shall fall into destruction, and as he has stands on such slippery decline ground on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone when he is when he let go, he immediately falls and is lost. The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. God could drop us off into hell any time if we don't repent. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least agree, or in any respect whatsoever, any hand in the preservation of wicked men in one moment. The truth of this observation may appear by the following considerations. There is no want of power in God's cast wicked men into hell at any moment. So what it's saying here, we we, we deserve hell. I mean, every one of us, this preacher and, and you and uh, anybody that's here, um, you, you have to realize the lostness of humanity and not only the lostness of humanity, but the lostness of we as individuals. You see, we're all saved on an individual basis. You don't get saved in groups. You don't get saved by families. You don't get saved by denominations. You don't get saved by um, uh, doing a certain thing, being baptized or being confirmed or or doing good works or or like that rich ruler, remember the one that come to Jesus uh, he said, I did this, and he did that, and, and on and on and on, and he uh, he didn't tell the truth at all, and I talk to people like that all the time. So so here God is, as Jonathan Edwards spoke in the, at, uh, the great leader in the Great Awakening there in the 1700s, he preached his sermon, 1741, that God could drop any one of us in the hell at any given moment uh, if we will not humble ourselves and seek his face and repent. Yeah, that's what America needs to do. And you and I, I'm a saved person, and I'm looking at people that are listening in today, and I know some of them very personally, and I believe they're saved and a child of God. Some of you, I I see your name up there. I don't know if you're saved or not. I hope you are. If you're not, you need to, because we all being the wicked sinners that we all deserve, as Jonathan Edwards says, to fall into hell at any moment. We're on slippery ground. We don't know what's going to happen. It could be at any time. He owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. It's nothing but his mercy and grace and the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross and the resurrection from the grave on the third day. Well, that's the only thing 
that can convert a sinner uh, like you and I. Oh, here we are, and people are glued to the television. I try to tell, I've been, this time we've had, we've not been able to assemble in, in church, but glory to God, I've been able to read my Bible and pray and seek his face. Why don't you do that, uh, dear Christian brother and sister? And let's be a blessing to people and try to encourage them on Facebook and through personal conversation, but most of all, lifting up others in prayer because prayer changes things. And the only way to change the heart of a, of a lost sinner uh, that I know and that you know is to pray and do everything we can to encourage them. But America's in trouble. The world's in trouble. God many times in the past has brought individual plagues to certain people or certain parts of the world, but this is this is universal. It's all over. The, it's all like I said. Uh, a rich man can't get in his jet and on escape from it. You can't hardly fly your jet today. So it's a time for we to rise up, dear Christian brother and sister. There is a hell. You 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 read it in such elegant terms. Jonathan Edwards, this very famous one of the most famous sermons. Uh, that has been through history preached in in uh, in 1741 by Jonathan Edwards, and he read it over and over, and others have read it, and he had preached it many times to great success. And I, I would encourage you um, uh, that you can look at. I put it up on Facebook on what you're watching this Facebook right now. I've got it up on there, uh, the Jonathan Edwards sermon, and you can read it word for word. And it tells the dest the wickedness of hell and the, and uh, as I, as as I said when we opened, some has come on since we opened this um, session, that um, uh, there were those that felt the fires of hell burning at their feet, and grabbed onto the poles um, that held up the building there. And in in those years, you had to have poles every few of so many feet to keep the roof up. And they just, they thought they were going to fall into hell. And there is a hell. And the only way we're going to have another awakening uh, and revival is that if the, if the reality of a burning hell is preached and repentance is preached, like Jonathan Edwards preached it and like John Wesley preached it and like George Mueller preached it and like George Whitfield preached it and on and on, and, uh, you know, the Bible, God says nothing changes the same. Yesterday, God's the same. The plan of salvation is the same. Repentance is necessary. We as Christians can hope. I, I'm tired of hearing of these religion, of humanism. I was going to say some things about the book of Judges today, and we're reading that in the Old Testament for you and our church that are watching in and we're in uh, Judges uh, uh, 15, 16, and 17, and we just, uh, we have um, uh, Samson, who was a mighty man of God, but a very, um, had a big woman problem. A lot of men have that today, too. It destroys many women, uh, destroys many men, uh, women, and, and a lot of times, you know, on this day of the, it's the fifth day of the month, and you read, we usually, a lot of times in church, Sunday school, we talk about the fifth proverb. You you read the, the fifth proverb, you read it for the day of the month, and it tells all about the wicked woman and how a man can uh, be be uh, ruined by sexual misconduct. Read it over. It's the fifth day of the month. I always read the fifth proverb on the fifth day uh, of the month. And so, and by the way, um, I had meant to, but I wanted to talk a little bit yesterday on the 4th about um, my wife and I were saved on April 4th, 1969. It has been 51 years yesterday that we were born again. 19310 Glenwood Lane, New Borough, Wisconsin. Uh, Pastor Broilow and, and uh, Pastor... Uh, I'm trying to think of his... Uh, Broilow's one led me to Christ and my wife. He was a special soul-winning pastor, Free Methodist Church. And um, 
I'm trying to think of um, who the pastor, nice man, but it wasn't a soul winner. But we were saved 51 years ago yesterday and been serving the Lord. And you know, being saved is different, different than, um, I've been saying this lately. We, we kind of talk about Christianity is like me and joining the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or uh, the Elks Club or uh, a social club or something. It's just another organization, but it's, it's, see, Christianity is a life. It's old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And because the old life is a life of sin and wickedness and worldliness, and we have to turn from that. And sad to say that the answer that we have in what is so-called Christianity, even in what's so-called evangelical Christianity, it's just, I don't think a lot of it's real. Much of it is very worldly, very self-centered, very humanistic. And sad to say, I think in many cases they have another Jesus. They don't have the Jesus of the Bible. They have a so-called Christianity that isn't Christianity at all. At all, the real Christianity has to do with wicked sinners repenting and being saved and having a new life in Christ and living different, separate in the world, but not of the world. Is that you today? Are you in the world, but not of it? Or are you just, uh, just skipping right along and being a very worldly person and calling yourself a Christian? They, they've got this now. A lot of people now tell me uh, that, that they, and I ask if they're, if they're Christian. Yes, I'm a Christian. And uh, they, they give me this exact answer. I don't know. The devil's putting it out everywhere. Well, how do you know you're Christian? I've received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. They tell me that, those very words. Then I ask them, well, when did you do that? And then they'll say, when I was baptized. I get that often. And then it will say that, well, I've always been a Christian, or this and that. So really, if that meant something, the devil's got to spit that out. I think a lot of people that aren't really saved. But it has to be, if Jesus is your personal Savior, it means that you've seen the wickedness of your own life and who you are, and that you've repented, and old things have been passed away, like it tells us in Ephesians 2. You have to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sin. We're all dead in trespasses and sins. And then um, the um, the new life in Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all things becoming new. Living in the world, but not being of the world. Oh, that's what it is. Judgment is to come. I want to use that example of the Great Awakening and Jonathan Edwards and sinners in the hands of an angry God, one of the most... Uh, repeated prayers and known prayers in the world. And I want you to look at it. You can find it on my Facebook. Just go on Interline. you got a smartphone or a smart computer and just put it in there, Jonathan Edwards Centers, and, and you'll get it and you read it free. And I even, mine, mine works so I can hit it and they'll read it to me while I'm reading it with them. And that has more emphasis yet. But in Sunday school today, I wanted to say that there will be a judgment for those that are lost and there will be victory for we that are saved. We that are saved are few. They that are lost are multitudes. There hasn't really been many people that have died of these coronavirus. I'm not trying to de-emphasize the importance of one people that have died. But if you die and you're saved, you go to heaven. The problem is most people that are dying are dying and going to hell. What about you? What about you? Are, are you going to die and go to hell? If you've never repented and turned from your sins sincerely and seen that you're on slippery ground, you could fall off into hell at any second. And God would have no apology to make for you. We deserve hell. But for the grace of God, if you're not saved, let's pray the prayer together now. Lord, I pray for these that are watching today. If they're not 100% sure they're saved, if they haven't seen the wickedness 
of their lives and the evilness and the wicked heart that they have. Speak to them, convict them, dear Lord. Help them to see they need to call upon. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray this sinner's prayer now. The Holy Spirit showing you that you're lost. This is the prayer. Pray it with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a wicked sinner. I have an evil heart. I was born into sin. I've lived a sinful life. I see the need for the blood of Christ to be applied. I believe you died for me and shed your blood. I'm trusting 100% in you. I'm turning from my way of sinning and self-righteousness and calling upon you to save me right now. Please, Lord, save me. You said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm calling upon you now. Save me. Lord, I hope many have done this today like I did. April the 4th, 1969, 51 years ago yesterday. It worked in. It worked in the day of Jonathan Edwards in 1741. It, it worked in the Bible times, and you're faithful. Thankful for those that are saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, dear one, if you are saved, or if you got saved today, share this with someone else. You know how to push the buttons and do it. I don't know a lot about this. I just push the thing and get it going, and then I'm going to push finish now. Then I'm going to get ready and, and have church in a little bit, and I think you're going to enjoy our church service too. It's in our reading for the New Testament today in Luke chapter 10, verse 27 verses. God bless you. We'll talk to you later.